Welcome back to the special edition of Talks About the Future, organized by Alumni Association and World Link Foundation. Well, our lives have turned remote for the past few months, and in fact, we're only beginning to actually sort out the real meaning of the phrase today. Does remote mean more together or more apart? And how is it changing the way we work, learn, teach, communicate, or even have fun and party. Most of us are still learning how to live and work remotely, but those who are at school, students, pupils, have it even harder because they need to learn how to learn in a remote way. So what are the challenges of remote education? How to design effective remote learning and teaching environment? We'll talk about it today. I'm Greg Nawrotsky and I'm joined by a panel of distinguished experts today. And let me just welcome all of them. Uh, Maciej Broniarz, the University of Warsaw Computer Network Division. Hello, Maciej. Hello. Uh, Alison Daly uh, from Wayne Community College, United Hello. States. Hello. Olga Orac, uh, who is uh, an IB high school in Krakow, Usme Paula. She's a student. Hello, Olga. Hello. Natasha Sharma, all the way from India today, Worldlink Foundation Hello. Strategy and Communications Director, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and Konstantia Szymańska at uh, Florida Atlantic University of the United States. Hello. Hello. Well, I hope that uh, our viewers will join us as well in an active way. All your remarks and questions are more than welcome during this discussion, please leave them in a comment underneath this live broadcast that you're watching at the moment. All right, so let's start. Is, in your opinion, remote learning a good thing or a bad thing altogether? Uh, perhaps perhaps let's, let's start with Alison, with your uh, perspective from, from, from the college. Thank you. Uh, well, we know that it's a necessary thing. So when we look at the, uh, previously, research has been focused on, you know, what is better, face-to-face -face classes or online classes. And um, Constantia will distinguish probably the difference between online and remote learning for us. But um, with we can't have that discussion so much anymore. We have to make effective remote learning. It's a necessary thing. We, we may not have the option uh, well, we don't have the option to just sit back and say, you know, schools are trying to work on how to have students come on campus or not. And they don't, they haven't even made those decisions yet. We plan on having a, an A day and a B day so that we can split classes in half at the community college. And this way, um, we may have 12 students in a classroom at a time. So half of the class will be doing work online um, and it's remote learning, but we can do it synchronous or asynchronous. Um, so these are these are challenges. The truths of learning are that students transfer um, and be, and engage in the learning and that it's not just the typical past way of putting um, and, and we've moved away from this model, but initially online learning was lectures that students mm -hmm. worked through individually. And we have moved away from that model, um, but making sure that all teachers know how to be effective online is what our essential question is today, right? <laughs> so and I'll, I know Constantia has some things to say about the difference between, this is what her dissertation is. Mm -hmm. Yes, Don't hello you. everyone. Um, You've been pointed to, yeah. Yes, I was appointed by Allison. Thank you so much, <laughs> Allison. Um, I I completely agree with Allison when we really talk about the the luxury of speculate you know speculating if uh, remote learning is good for our students or not. We really um, don't have a choice right now. We had to adapt very very quickly. Um, our intensive English institute at Florida Atlantic University we basically moved our entire curriculum into a remote instruction. So the difference between remote instruction and online instruction, like Allison mentioned, is basically going into a modules and self-paced work um, while remote learning is, uh, at least at our Intensive English Institute, 
we have live lectures, just like we're talking right now and having this discussion. Um, this is what we define as remote learning. So our students have to be ready, you know, in the morning and in the afternoon to go into a lecture and interact with uh, their classmates and their instructors. So, uh, and they have to be live, they have to be ready, the cameras have to be on, um, microphones have to be on unless the professor tells them to, to mute it, right? So for us, um, what we really wanted to accomplish when we moved into remote learning was to keep the high quality instruction and the expertise that we had during the in-person instruction, but you said, right? But you said that the key thing was to know how to adapt Right. How, how, how do you do it? Uh, we we have to... dived into a deep water, so mm -hmm. it would be good to sort of perhaps right. exchange experiences so that we can learn remotely ab about how to teach remotely. <laughs> Absolutely. So we really um, connected with other departments on campus that, you know, are famous for providing a, a remote instruction. For example, College of Business here. We have a lot of, you know, uh, mature learners or um, people who are working. And uh, the only type of instruction that they can take upon is the remote one, right? If somebody has a full-time job, they have to uh, learn remotely. So we have certain departments on, on our campus, a lot of them actually, that yeah. offer that always offer remote programs or instruction. Okay. So what we did, so we connected those departments. Always, it's not a new thing for you, basically. It's not a new thing for you. It's just the scale that is different. Right. The university itself, we offered that type of learning before for many, many, many years. However, when it comes to language training, which is what our institute provides, we have never offered remote instruction, okay? Right. When right. international students wanted to come to the United States and learn English, they had to participate in person classes. Okay. So, you know, learning English mm. overall online uh, for many of them with a the time difference um, is challenging. Um, yeah. So we had to adapt and have those intentional conversations with our students you know, we uh, yep. it's a it's a group project. It's a group effort. It's okay. not just us administration saying uh, we're moving remotely because who is the most important person right. in this whole thing? Our instructors, they are doing the work every single day and the students are interacting with our instructors. Right. Okay. So we right. have to make sure we provide the, the, sure. the, the support sure. for instructors. Uh, Matthew, can I ask you about what, what do you think? What, what do you think about the, these challenges and whether it's a good or a bad thing altogether, even though we know it's necessary? Well, first of all, it's a necessity. As you mentioned, there are basically two areas that need to be covered. There is a technical area and there is the, uh, the teaching area. In terms of teaching, uh, me, myself as an academic teacher, find the uh, remote learning uh, a bit more demanding in terms of teaching and uh, mm a bit less rewarding because you lose the most important uh, element, the, the interaction with the student. Mm -hmm. And there are certain areas where basically uh, it is very hard to transfer the uh, course online. Can I just uh, ask, but you actually do have a, you actually do have a, uh, a conversation or a reaction, some kind of reaction from the other side when you are online. Uh, it's a different kind of relationship, of course, but you think it's lower quality. It's lower quality because, for, for example, in, in my experience, I teach computer forensics. So we basically mm. very often work on a digital evidence of a crime or an analog mm. evidence of a crime. And it is very different to work in a group and to discuss a topic where you uh, have the people in the room where you can work with the equipment right. and you basically have some kind of laboratory work mm -hmm. to conduct. Uh, it is virtually impossible to transfer that kind of work online. And I believe that my friends in the physics or chemistry or biology department find it even more uh, annoying. And uh, then there is a technical field where you need to um, be sure that even if the university, uh, Washington University had the technology um, allowing us to conduct online training for years, uh, and even we didn't have much of a problem when the scale began to, um, to show, uh, because the, the transition was made within a week and we have about 50,000 students at the University of Warsaw, so it's quite a large city. 
the problem is the connectivity on the side of the student because very often mm -hmm. when you have like five or six people living in an apartment and they need to conduct online yeah. work access online training all that stuff uh, then suddenly the internet bandwidth uh, is limited uh, and uh, in terms of families i have friends uh, who for example have kids in schools and suddenly uh, providing hardware for every kid in the house and internet connectivity and cameras and all that stuff it's basically a great it's, cost yeah it, it is a cost and very often it's the cost that family can't uh, make in one single month they need to diversify uh, and that is a problem um, in many cities in poland where the kids basically are put out of the schooling system in in part or in general just because the, the families can't afford the equipment all right can i just ask olga how do you like it? Well, um, my school, I'm really lucky to be in this school because uh, the school acted really quickly. So basically just after uh, the information online came out that uh, we are uh, in entering the lockdown, uh, they organized an online plat platform where all of the classes were held and it went really smoothly. So I think that in my case, uh, the lockdown and the online classes transition was really needed because we were able to take uh, the time off a little bit. So for me, I didn't have to travel uh, two hours <laughs> to school so I could focus on myself a little bit more. And yeah, I yeah, think about, about that, what, this is what Maciek said uh, a second ago about this kind of relationship that is a, a different kind of relationship between a student and a, and a teacher. Did you have that feeling as well? That was a different, yeah, I think so too. Because sometimes uh, when we had classes, uh, children of the teacher would enter and we had to stop. And I think that we entered a little bit more intimate relationship on mm -hmm. this level uh because yeah we get to know like another side of the teacher yeah so coming back to my first initial question does it this re remote type of education does it bring you closer to one another or or, or or feeling a bit more apart i think in this case it brought us closer because we learned how to adapt we mm. had to be patient and we had to act quickly on different situations. All right. New skills to develop, basically. Natasha. Yes, over to you. Over to you. What do you think? So, Jacques, I think it's a mix of both. But let's say the one, I mean, apart from the many challenges that we can, of course, talk about, one is the lack of human touch, as we say. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to look at it um, you know, look at the greener picture. And that is two points I want to pick up here, which I noticed is that firstly, you know, what it, ha what it has done is that students and teachers both have developed some skills that are so essential for the 21st century. And they have come like just so naturally to them. Students mm -hmm. are learning skills that they will need to be successful in the future. So modern learning now is about collaborating with others, solving right. the complex problems, critical thinking, developing different forms of communication, leadership skills, improving motivation, self-motivating. There's nobody checking you. You can very easily not attend any of the classes, but you know that you have yeah, to. But Natasha, is this a good yeah. thing or a bad thing? I'm just thinking that perhaps this kind of self-motivation thing could be a, a tricky uh uh, a, a tricky syndrome because if you don't have anybody trying to motivate you, perhaps you might find it difficult to to focus, to get concentrated on 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 work. Am I wrong? At the end of the day, Jagosh, any successful person in this world has himself behind him. Honestly, so you have to do it for yourself. Nobody does it for you. So this realization actually is coming a lot sooner in the kids. And it is absolutely amazing to see when my six year old, you know, comes and tells me, Mama, I have a class now and you must log me in. 
and you know it is really really inspiring because the, i'm not telling him rather i'm thinking okay let him skip for a day it's too much screen time but no he wants to see his peer group he wants to see his teachers he wants to participate he wants to show what he's done uh, the you know previous day and he is very proud to discuss with the teacher what he's done how he's done the new skills he's developing so it's really important and plus also they are becoming technically so savvy it is unbelievable what these last two months have done not just to teachers sometimes you know they had to adapt overnight some teachers they didn't know what to do and then suddenly everybody is pro at it my 6 year old is telling me mama you are pressing the wrong button this is how you are supposed to do he is telling his teachers ma'am you are logged in twice that's why right. you have to go you need to log out you know it's yeah. absolutely marvelous so sure. from all, what i understand uh, and it uh, crops up in a, at least a few uh mm, words from from your side is the the keyword would be engagement how to keep students absolutely. engaged online it's the magic that, that it's not that easy teachers have to put a m- m- much more effort to do that yeah. in in these yeah. new circumstances can you just share some ideas what do you do to keep your students engaged and active and well motivated while they're hanging on the hammock or something <laughs> um, I, i i think that natasha has one really good side she's seeing a certainly a positive side of this challenge is that because there's a real challenge that's worldwide many students have risen to the occasion and adapted to it with these 21st century skills but as and also as a teacher we know that when we lose that face to face connection um as machi said we've got we lose the a lot of the signals that we as professionals use to exactly. see whether our students are really it engaging in the material mm-hmm. um if i'm in a classroom and i look out at my students i can see who's nodding their head and i can also see who's sort of maybe checked out or maybe who is confused and so those um those moments where i'm reading their body language are times when i can say i can move around the classroom i can address I might even address a student and say I can what are you thinking you have an interesting look on your face I can see that you're thinking yeah, something yeah, sure. can you tell me mm-hmm. you know are you confused or what was your thought there or I might even pair people up that I might know a stronger student might be able mm-hmm. to help a student that maybe just isn't getting this concept and say have a conversation um because when we when we give real face to face conversations we have these natural interactions and we can create small groups those are possible in online learning and this is one of the challenges of of getting the remote learning at its best is that engagement that the teacher has designed opportunities for students to ask authentic questions and that they are really really present in that moment helping each other um and these are ways we can get them to grow our challenge is to get them not only to understand the content but to be able to um understand how they're learning it's that epistemological stance sure. so that they can um they can leave the classroom with the soft skills and the content material um which that they need yeah constance exactly. I, i can see you you're you're nodding so you probably agree would you like to add something to i am um, um um You know, I think um our students um some of them shared with us that when it came to the remote instruction it was um sometimes even more challenging um when it comes to you know acquiring the material um you know during the class time in person they can ask many questions raise their hands sometimes they feel uh, they might feel uh you know that they have to wait and to ask the question however we set up with our students you know uh tutoring online mm-hmm. and what we've noticed is that our students they do stay engaged uh during class but what they really miss is staying engaged with their classmates outside mm-hmm. of the classroom because everything was closed sure, so we, did, what we had to do about it i'm sorry you do something about it yeah How right So uh we we wanted to create something more fun that would you know re- remind students of uh the engagement class also outside of the classroom so we had 
cultural talks. We had leadership workshops with them that um, they would connect with other student, students during that time. And once they are back in the classroom, they feel even more connected. But I 100% agree with Allison when it comes to asking authentic questions or asking transparent questions. And also a key word during this time, just being patient and gracious to students is absolutely key. You know, students uh, got closer with their instructors because many times they see their family members passing in the background and their animals and their babies and their kids or, or their partners. So they created this type of, you know, a uh, closer relationship, but, you know, keeping the motivation uh, on a high standard, it takes time. So we, we made sure we, we provide some type of entertainment to our students outside yeah. of the classroom too. Yeah, I, I, I understand all of you in, in your uh, institutions, wherever you work, uh, you develop your own practices, you, you come up with your own ideas. Uh, right. I think it would be good and I'm sure it's happening. It's just that I'm not sure about how exactly, but perhaps yeah. those teachers who will be watching us might find it interesting how to exchange that, that, that kind of experience that, that, uh, that you're actually going through at the moment with your ideas with, uh, um, for future uh, solution, uh, even on an international level, just as we're speaking at the moment. Are there any fora that we can exchange these experiences worldwide? in teaching, uh, remote teaching? Oh, well, this is one of them, right? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yes, we're doing it on our small scale, but is this happening worldwide on a bigger scale? Uh, I think that there are a lot of people who are doing, um, like, I know that there are people, the educators who are have, like, online streaming and people right. for professional development or even been part of like YouTube conversations or following mm -hmm. our channel. And they're having um, conversations about, you know, when we come back to the classroom, what are we going to do? But also until yeah. then, what are we going to do? All right. and here, I think that within our institutions, we're also having those conversations. Um, we, yeah. Yes. And we try to also keep and engage our students on social media. So, you know, uh, how are you how are you going to relate to one another when i'm speaking with allison or natasha or maciej about certain experiences uh that we we're familiar with we will be able to say okay i understand what she's going through or what they're going through because we are experiencing a similar uh issue so our students when they see what other students say about that uh they also feel closer so on our social media, you know, we try to post uh, what are the best tips of staying motivated or yeah. what are the best tips or keeping on track. And then students uh, can interact with each other as well. So I think there are many groups. It's, you know, it's just which one is best for you. Okay. And I think the Worldly Foundation is one of those groups, you know, enabling yeah. students to be able to work so that when you mentioned Constantia, the students being able to talk to each other about what they're right experiences, students around the world can like attend the global student on a hammock. And right. I just go, go back to, to, to Maciej and ask exactly the same uh, question. <laughs> Would you find it helpful? Uh, are you using these international experiences that, that are available uh, in different places? Uh, well, there are a few areas where that was particularly useful. Mm, we started using social media basically from the first day of the lockdown and we uh, notice that the content um, that we provide for our um, academics basically is being transferred to other universities all over Europe. And suddenly people from schools uh, in, in a different part of the country or mm. a different country at all, uh, tried to contact us because they had some technical issues or some questions how to solve a um, particular problem. And you know. uh, what was really beneficial uh, was that basically the community started to give back. If you, for example, solve the problem for somebody, uh, then that person would um, try to contribute in a different way, for example, to share the knowledge or to share some ideas that they have developed. Uh, and we s created two groups on Facebook, one dedicated to academic teachers, where we have like 3,000 people actually at the moment, and the, the other group dedicated to uh, primary and um, higher learning, and we have 
almost 10,000 people are active there. And people uh, started creating their own ideas, sharing presentations, and uh, basically uh, trying to show up and to contribute what they can do yeah. in their own way. Yeah. But it seems that step by step, we're actually entering a completely new chapter in the history of, of education, mm -hmm. uh, even though we still don't see exactly where it will it will end but i'll just pop the question from one of our uh, viewers can teachers and that's a question for you can teachers be replaced by technology no, <laughs> no. <laughs> technology is a means but um students the personal connection the mentorship uh, it, piece cannot be replaced by technology you know, someone encouraging you and customizing your learning and being able to see, hey, you're doing this really well, but over here, there are certain things that just are creative mm -hmm. and computer algorithm um, can do a lot to, to help, you, you know, record your grades, maybe even give a quiz, but uh, writing complex activities, they need, they need a human. Yeah, Olga. No surprise there. <laughs> Olga, do you really need a human, or need, or yeah. do you need a good AI robot who would substitute the teacher with his or her humors and all the rest of it? No, no, I totally agree. <laughs> there is no algorithm that would work for every single student, and we need this uh, personal touch. We need this understanding because we, as teenagers, there's a lot of happening in our lives. We're changing, developing in different ways. Uh, we're also uh, trying new things and trying also to find ourselves. So we need that help in a form of a human being that also has emotions and knows how to understand different situations. Jagosh, if I may, actually, they say that teacher is the cause and student they are the effect. So imagine if there were no teachers and they were only the technology. So we will all be walking robots without any human in, uh, touch to us. And how different and uh, sad would be the world. So, so this, is very convincing. Important. <laughs> this is very and convincing. All right. Okay. There is, uh, there is one issue that um, is virtually impossible to uh, maintain while working uh, remotely. It is very hard to uh, notice uh, a talent in a student. Uh, as from the academic perspective, when we are working with a group who are looking for people who qualify to go to a PhD training or basically to work at university, and uh, it is very hard to create such a, a, a relation with a student where you only know them through the internet. and. Uh, where basically you try to standardize the um, the interaction with everyone. It is very mm -hmm. hard to, um, to grab that one percent of special people and basically help them succeed. Why is it so? Why is it harder? Because you would imagine that if if you want to accept somebody for a PhD or another, pro you're just checking the academic credentials. You can do it without talking to a person. You can. Do you know what I'm saying? Is this yeah, that again yeah. the personal traits that would be important for a for an application process or an acceptance process? I think it depends a, on the on the area, Maciej, right? Basically, there is a difference between the best person and the right person, and All when right. we are That's trying cool. to. Um, basically encourage somebody for PhD training, we need the right person, not the, some, someone who has the best credentials and the best scores, mm -hmm. uh, because he doesn't have the, that spark in him that will make him a good teacher or a good scientist. Mm -hmm. So, what, so oh, all right, okay, okay. So just just, just to clear, because it's an, it's an interesting uh, uh, thing for me. So uh, that kind of lack of personal uh, interaction is, uh, an impediment to a a, a, a a professional process of recruiting a, a proper candidate. Yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, that's the problem. And the second problem is that uh, mm. when you are working with people in a, a regular way, mm. and you meet them, you talk them, you basically learn to uh, guide them, and you. Um, Basically, it is easier for you to find the problems that they have and help yeah. them solve them. When you are, have a group of people all around the internet and uh, you have 
less uh, amount of time and smaller amount of your attention to devote to them. And basically that is the disadvantage of online learning. Mm -hmm. so if I may add to that, so our process is completely the opposite. So if we want to sponsor or invite a student from abroad to join us for a PhD program, uh, the online interaction is the only interaction we get uh, very often. So we that's the type of relationship we have to develop before the student gets on campus. So very often when students apply, we look, you know, at a student holistically, mm -hmm. uh, but we only get to see a student online uh, via, you know, conversations, via Skype, other platforms. So it's very interesting what, what Maciej said too. I know that in Poland, um, that's usually how the process works, that you develop a relationship more of in person, and then you can recommend a student to pursue a PhD. Here's the Here's the opposite. So I think that's, that's yeah, very but the process that you described basically still focuses on one to one interaction. Yeah, and right. So when you have a classroom of like 50 to 200 people, it is virtually impossible to have a one to one right. interaction with anybody. Right. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, Natasha, uh, a global student on a hammock, a yes. webinar, what is it going to be about? So, as we said that uh, this is for the students who want to uh, take that first step and they want to be ahead of the world, they want to conquer the world, but still lying on the hammock. So, what we are going to do is that we are going to have these four Mondays uh, in August, where we are going to be focusing, we have some lovely speakers and uh, at World Foundation, and we are going to be focusing on innovation, innovated uh, innovative ways of thinking and critical thinking, design thinking a lot. We'll talk a lot about public speaking and uh, technology. So I think it's going to be very interesting for the mm -hmm. students who want to work upon themselves. This is a proactive step and who want to make the best of these uh, vacations that they have. Sure. All right. So let's focus on the students or in fact one student that we have uh, mm -hmm. today with us. Olga, perhaps you could actually give us a few tips or sort of uh some kind of advice to teachers and and principals what could they do to make it even better all those ideas that we've tried to exchange what do you think well i think certainly communication is the key here so having a clear platform for communicating for uh, asking questions and also conducting surveys so that uh, we get to know what actually uh, students think mm. works best for them, because all of us are unique in a different way. And we need to have, um, like I said, a personal uh, touch to everything we do. Uh, so certainly this, and certainly also sharing uh, different platforms because as uh, all of us could see, uh, when the whole world entered lockdown, uh, many universities opened up to uh, free lectures and having a platform where everything is available for students is a really good thing. Do you like the idea of a global education as such? Would you like to, the, the, when you uh, finish your school, go abroad somewhere to study in a, in a different country, in a different culture? Do you think it's, it, it's, it's a good idea? I think it's a great idea because it really teaches you how to think globally, how to step outside of your comfort zone, how to expand your horizons, how to be open-minded. And also it uh, gives you a different perspective. Mm. on the on life and on different issues yeah, right weren't you a bit sad that you had a virtual graduation rather than a personal one well of course i was a <laughs> bit because i uh couldn't see my friends but after that oh, as the lockdown eased up a little bit uh we met each other so it was fine <laughs> <laughs> all right okay we've got another question from from one of our viewers we, we, we've touched on it already, but the question is this, what would be good tips for schools and principals? Perhaps that's a question from a principal. Uh, tips for schools, principals and teachers and students connected with the use of technology more effectively. So a few tips on that from our team. 
I think if I can just add really quickly, I think uh, always looking for ways to connect with consultants or people who already have uh, an experience with this type of, uh, you know, learning. Because I, I truly believe that working with experts, whether they're, they are technology experts or linguistic experts, can make the whole experience for students so much more successful including for principals, you know, this is the new reality that we had to adjust to. So, but there are certain, you know, places or divisions that this is not a new type of learning, right? So I think connecting with others uh, and definitely, you know, attempting a joint effort would, would be, would be uh, something that, that I would recommend. Um, hearing from students, hearing from teachers, uh, try, and, you know, gathering research also, um, on which type of platforms are the most effective, which ones allow, you know, for students to have a breakout, uh, which type which type of platforms uh, are, you know, the most uh, effective for students and, and teachers. I mean, there's so many little details that uh, would make the whole experience better. But I think just consulting with others who... Yeah. We have experience with this type of learning. I know that we're from different countries, perhaps different cultures, all including educational cultures. But if you think about next, let's don't even make it 10 years because that's a long period of time. But let's say five years. How do you think the education uh, will look in five years time? How very different will it be from what we know from last year or a few months, months back? I think for starters, Jagosh, education will never be the same again. And it's really going to be very much more skills oriented than solely knowledge based, as used to be the case for years together. So now, you know, like the ability of the students to ask really good questions, to synthesize the information, to present it in different ways, to really understand the global competitive landscape but, and also the global opportunities. These are the things that really the schools and the education and the teachers and even the parents are going to be focusing on uh, in the coming years. And probably grades are not the only things that are going to matter in the coming uh, few years. This is how I see it is a big change. The whole uh, way of thinking is changing for students, for teachers, for parents, for each of us. There is one component of uh, learning that basically wasn't covered um, up until now during our discussion because we are we are talking about learning and transferring knowledge but there is also the issue of testing knowledge and uh, okay. that would probably be the case in the next few years how to evaluate the knowledge of a student and how to um, basically test them and check uh, um, the progress that they made during the year because uh, when you make a test online it is extremely different from the same test that is conducted in the classroom and it is very hard to check the knowledge on daily basis and basically um, monitor the progress of the student well, and to why is it different why is it different because of the uh because of the possibility of some kind of a fraud or what do you what do you have in mind First of all, uh, for example, when I'm teaching classes for like uh, 200 students, I mm -hmm. tend to ask them a few questions every few minutes just to keep them engaged and uh, to provide mm -hmm. some interaction. It is uh, more difficult to um, conduct online because there are some people who are just afraid to um, to speak or they don't want to um, contribute in any way. On the other hand, when you make a test just to check their knowledge at the end of the semester, it is uh, easier to um, basically to cheat. So you need All to right. redesign the whole process of uh, evaluation and uh, on the one hand, to uh, make cheating virtually impossible, but on the other hand, to still monitor the progress of the student and to understand how they are thinking and what led them to the conclusion that they yeah. put in the test. Right. So that is a, a lot of more work to the um, teacher, actually. Mm -hmm. OK. Anybody would like to add anything? I've got one more yeah. important question, but I'm keeping it till the very end, uh, end of our discussion. I think well, there's another element to this as far as like the higher education, you know, in the United States and in many places in the world, you know, the just the idea of students living on campus and being in close proximity 
um, you know, this is a challenge, whether schools will even open up if they'll be completely online and how that will affect their budgets and their programming. Um, that affects funding. Uh, and there may be some things, you know, some schools and some programs that are cut. And, and I think this is, we're going to see drastic changes. I think some of them will be um, empowering and some of them will also um, be a sort of a pruning, but it won't just be cutting off the things that um, were not effective or were dead. It'll be cutting off, it'll be cutting some things like drastically. And I'm wondering, um, you know, five years from now, what will look like? In some ways, I think we may be better. And in some ways, I think we may have lost some really key elements of our, our campus life. Mm. You know, so. And this is, ex ex this is extremely important for Olga, who is listening to it attentively, because <laughs> she knows that in five years, she will be just in the middle of it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yes, yes. But also, if it comes to uh, testing, I had to, and my friends, we had to face the problems of distractions. So we were really scared that uh, a dog will start barking in the middle of the test or a brother will enter the room and it will distract us. And that was really stressing because this would affect our grade. And then also uh, we were afraid that the connection will go off and we will lost some time and that would, uh, also really affect uh, the way we were scoring. So it yeah, was hard. Completely, completely new issues, completely new issues to students and teachers. Barking dogs during the school time. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Now tell me, can we've talked about, we've talked about teachers and students, but there's also a third party to the whole, uh, to the whole idea. It's the, the parents. Mm -hmm. How can we make parents allies in this uncertain uh, process of, of, of transition of the education from, from the traditional one into the re remote or the education of the future? Do they understand it? Are they partners in this process, you think? Jagosh, if I may, yeah. I, I can do this question. Being a parent to two kids and doing this virtual learning for like, I don't know, for the longest time. Yeah. So uh, I would say, yes, the parents are partners um, to this process. We are trying to contribute to the best of our ability. But here I'd like to bring uh, one thing uh, to everyone's notice. And that is that as parents, how we can contribute the best uh, is that first we need to take care of yourself. Mm. It is a very well known thing that when we are in the aeroplane, we are told to put the oxygen mask first and then help try and help others. Yeah. And yeah. our kids, they are very receptive to what's uh, going on in their surrounding with the parents. So if we are very stressed, if we are very agitated, the kids just absorb the energy. So we have to be kind to ourselves. We have to be kind to our kids. We have to be more patient. We have to uh, we have to really understand that they are little and they are in the same position as we are in. They are stuck at home, and so you know we have to be like more patient in general. And secondly, we have to be contributive. We have to understand that we have to stop. We have to choose our battles wisely with our kids. We have mm. to stop pushing them over every little thing. We have to stop telling them that, listen, he finished his assignment yesterday, so and so did this and did such a nice artwork and you aren't doing anything. So this is not what we have to do. We have to try and see that they are unique. They are not good or bad. They are different. And we have to try as parents to hone those special skills of theirs and we have to be there for them and we have to build that trust with them. So I think that's important. Right, we'll be rounding up soon because we're, we're slowly starting to run out of time. So perhaps can each of you just for a minute or, or a minute and a half at, 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 uh, at the most, just some kind of parting thought, some kind of conclusions after, after this uh, conversation. We've touched on 
really different subjects sometimes in a bit of a chaotic a chaotic way. but that's but that's that that's the reality uh, the questions are re uh, from our viewers are really also very very different including the the latest which will be can we lower the amount of hours spent on teachers meetings at school i can see it's a, it's a cl close to your heart issue <laughs> right but we don't have the time to dwell uh, much on uh, on this particular thing at the moment. So uh, let's start perhaps with Constancia, just a, a conclusion from, from, from this meeting today. Yes, I think uh, for our students and, and our wonderful instructors all around the world, um, supporting each other, being gentle with each other, understanding and supportive is absolutely the key in making the global education uh, work. And, uh, you know, if anyone would like to speak about any issues regarding, you know, foreign language anxiety or how to, um, how to really make the remote learning work, I'm more than happy to provide any type of uh, support yes. as well. So but being gen I'm sorry. We are accepting, accepting your offer. Yes, <laughs> yes, right. absolutely. Right. But being gentle and supportive, I think that's, right. uh, that's one of the most important. Uh, basically, uh, the public school system was designed to include everyone that would like to be included and to not left anyone behind. And the biggest challenge that we will be facing in the next years is to redesign the system to uh, utilize the whole internet learning experience and mm -hmm. still do not leave anyone behind because suddenly it is not just the case to school but the case of your parents being able to afford internet access equipment all the stuff or the parents having to decide whether to give the laptop to the one kid or another because right. they have only wanted to go yeah mm -hmm. and that is the probably the most crucial issue uh, both the parents the academia and the state as well uh, because we will have a generation that is being left uh, behind just by um, basically lack of uh, resources right thank you uh, natasha uh, my advice would be common for the students teachers and the parents that please do take care of yourself take some me time out for yourself during the day to exercise eat healthy try and give some um, time to meditation listen to good music do anything that makes you happy and keep the others around you happy the world's changing very fast but that's okay we are supposed to bloom wherever we are planted so we are all in it together <laughs> okay little about technology in these parting thoughts okay allison well i would say that for teachers thinking of how to design things for their students to keep true to the um the principles that we know make students learn and also to include what Olga said about how much the students are missing seeing each other would be to include ways for students to make the learning personal to allow engagement between students so that they can um, they can activate their learning together and help um, give each other feedback so that they can reach those learning goals and to think about how to do that with novelty. So don't do everything the same way, the same time, because it gets boring, right? <laughs> right. It's boring to have the, the students are like, oh no, another lecture, or oh no, another, the teacher does this exact same way. Think of ways to deliver it in an original or creative way, and your students will see that you're trying. They are patient with us too. And um, if they know that you're trying hard for them, they they come and they engage with us in a more authentic way. Okay. Olga, you know that the most important thing is always the one that is set at the very, very last moment yeah. of a meeting. And that <laughs> moment belongs to you. Yes. Well, I think that uh, the most important thing uh, here is the conversation. So having feedback from both sides because we as students are also really interested in technology and we may know some, uh, yeah. well, how to solve some problems that the teachers are facing. So just don't be afraid to ask questions ask and also always ask for feedback. All right, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this was the special edition of uh, Talks About the Future. Thank you, Maciej Broniarz, Alison Daly, Olga Orac, Natasha Sharma, and Constancia 
Shemaiska, thank you uh, for this uh, meeting today. It was a very resourceful and uh, a very good one. Very good one. And uh, till next time, have a very good evening. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.